Well, it's my joy uh, to welcome our guest speaker this morning. No guest to us and our newest elder here at Cornerstone, Mr. Eric Fridge. Would you join me in welcoming him, please? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So very good to see you. It's, uh, it's always an honor for me to stand before you as we open up God's Word together. You know, we have been on a journey as a church family the last few months. We've been traveling through the Gospel of Mark. And we've been uh, looking at these stories and the life and the ministry of, of Jesus. And, um, you know, since, since the very moment that Jesus came to this earth until today, people have been asking a question. Who is Jesus? Now that's a critical question. It's a critical question for each of us to be able to answer, answer on our own, for our own faith, to be able to understand who Jesus is and what he has done in our lives. But it's also important for us to be able to answer that question for the people around us. Because as people look at your life and they see that there is something different, at times they will ask, who, who is this Jesus that you follow? Who who is he and what has he done for your life? We all need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. This week I sat down with uh, a couple of folks here at Cornerstone and I asked them that question, who is Jesus? I'm going to let you see their response uh, on the big screen behind me as uh, we watch this little video. Many people ask the question, who is Jesus? To me, it's, there's both an intellectual and a more personal answer. We have a poster at home that uh, is called, and he shall be called, and it has like 50 references to what scripture says about Jesus and what he's called. And but for me personally, the two of those that stand out the most is, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and he is my Lord and Savior. To me, Jesus is the Son of God, um, the Savior of the world, and my Redeemer. And when I think about Jesus, I think about how gentle he is and about his kindness. He is the kindest person that I've ever met. And he's also the light of the world. And when he shines, darkness leaves and he can speak one word and demons tremble. Jesus is the mediator in between God and man. By his death on the cross, he deserves the title of Savior of the world. By this death, man is able to accept God's free grace so that man can join him in heaven. Jesus is Lord of all creation. He's the Savior of the world. He has always existed, and he's coming back one day to restore all things to himself. He was not just a good man or a good teacher, uh, but he was God through and through, fully man, fully God. And what he did on our behalf changed everything. Jesus is the one who loves me. He loves me so deeply and so perfectly, and he loved me to the end. You know, as we read Mark's account, uh, the good news about Jesus, it, it's important to note that Mark didn't just grab a bunch of stories about Jesus and put them together for his book. Instead, Mark was, was writing this gospel because he wanted to address some very specific questions about whether or not Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Now, that, might, that term might not be familiar to you. Let me clarify a little bit. As you look at the Old Testament, there are multiple statements about a Messiah that would come. There's prophecy throughout the Old Testament that talks about this coming Messiah, it describes the Messiah as, as a royal figure, uh, the Messiah as the Son of God. And the Jewish people, they were anticipating and waiting for the Messiah to come and, and set up a kingdom here on earth. And it was about that time when Jesus came to earth that uh, the Jewish nation, Israel, was oppressed by Rome. Uh, Rome had occupied their region and, and soldiers had moved in and, and the Jews felt very, very oppressed. And so there was great anticipation at this time that, that God would send the Messiah to, to overthrow the Romans and to establish a king here on earth. 
But Jesus didn't come to overthrow the Romans. No, the one who healed the sick, who helped the lame to walk, caused the blind to see, the one who fed multiple people with just five loaves and two fish, The one who calmed the winds and the waves. The one who could walk on water. The one who could raise others from the dead. He didn't come to overthrow the Romans. Instead, he allowed himself to be arrested. To be falsely accused. To be mistreated. And that's exactly where our text leads us to today in Mark chapter 15. If you would go ahead and open up your Bibles. Mark 15 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time in. I will tell you, in preparation for this morning, I kept thinking, how am I going to teach this passage where so many of us as followers of Jesus have have read this text numerous times. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard on, on the crucifixion of Jesus. I've heard the details. I've heard all the things. And, you know, there's something about that. When you study something a lot and you hear about it, a lot, but sometimes it kind of gets numb to us. And I think sometimes as believers, when we think about the cross, we don't think about what really went on. We don't really take into account all the things that Jesus went through for us. When we talk about the cross, oftentimes we think about home decor or jewelry or or, or something that is just, it's just a part of us. And so what I want to ask you to do this morning is, as we're reading this text, I want to ask you to try to listen and read along with fresh eyes and fresh ears. To really see this text of what it is and, and to even take yourself there. I mean, we've been, we've been looking at these stories that tell us some great details about the life and the ministry of of Jesus. But as as we get to this point, which is really a critical point in the life and the ministry of Jesus, I want to ask that you try to go there. So with the sun rising and the rooster crowing, this is where we pick up in Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says this, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin, they made their plans. So they bound Jesus. They led him away and handed him over to Pilate. You see here at this time, Jesus has already been through a whole evening where he's been through trials with, um, in the Jewish courts. Uh, the religious leaders of the law, they, they have uh, taken Jesus. Uh, Dr. Keith Bauer did a great job last week in just helping us uh, understand what was going on as we read through uh, Mark 14. We know that Jesus was uh, uh, taken in the Garden of Gethsemane. His, his disciples, they began to scatter. And he begins to, to go through this court system in the religious Jewish law where these, these leaders, they came up with all sorts of accusations about who Jesus was. But yet... They couldn't do anything about it. They had declared him guilty, but there was only so much they could do. And so they knew that if if they really wanted to get rid of Jesus, if they really wanted to put him to death, they had to come up with such a way that they could present to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of the region, that Jesus had done something against Rome because it was only Rome who could put someone to death legally. And so that's what, that's what happens here. And so as Jesus goes before Pontius Pilate, he has all these accusations. And there's a conversation that's going on here. And as we read this section of Scripture, it's important to note that in each one of the Gospels, these events all are recorded. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they all come from a little different perspective. In each one of the different authors, they all highlight a couple of different things. And so as we go through this section, I'm going to pull in a couple pieces from those other Gospels to make sure that we have this whole story here. And so you can see here in verse 2, it says, Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked. 
You have said so, Jesus replied. You see, there's a conversation that's more than what is recorded here in Mark. In fact, if you go over to uh, Matthew chapter 27, where this is also recorded, Jesus elaborates a little bit because the Jewish leaders had come before Pilate and said, hey, this, this guy's trying to become a king. You know, he, he, he says he's the Messiah, he's the king of the Jews. Well, when, when Pilate has this conversation with Jesus, he's just really wanting to know one question. Are you trying to overthrow the government? I mean, that's really all Pilate, that's all he wants to know because for Pilate, he doesn't have a fun job. I mean, the Roman government that was set up there the Jews were a difficult people for them to deal with because they didn't understand all the Jewish laws, all the Jewish traditions. In fact, there was constant uproar. And, and so it was, it was Pilate's job to keep the peace. But it was difficult to do at, at times, and he didn't always understand. And so when he begins to have this conversation with Jesus, he's really just wanting to know one thing. Are you going to stir up trouble for me? And he says, he, he's asking him, you know, are you, are you a king? Are, are you, are, you know, are you going to be against Caesar? And Jesus lets him know, you can read this in Matthew 27. Jesus lets him know, he says, no, my kingdom is not, not here on this earth. And that's all Pilate needed to hear. He's like, I, I don't care what you say you're king of. As long as it doesn't mess things up here, then I don't care. And from this point on, Pilate continues to go on, and he is trying his very best to let Jesus go. He knows he's going to be punished. He knows he's already been through it. But he's really wanting to let Jesus go. Verse 3. The chief, the chief uh, priests accused him of many things. So Pilate again asked him, here's this question. Are you going to answer? See how many things they accuse you of. But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now, another thing that I want us to do as we're taking a look at this section of Scripture is in Mark chapter 14, there are a number of Old Testament prophecies that are prophesied about the coming of the Messiah that are fulfilled right here in Mark chapter 15. One of those comes with um, Isaiah 57 verse 3. You can see it here on the screen. There it is. <clears throat> it says this. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep before the shearers is silent, and he did not open his mouth. Pilate was amazed at this, that he had had all these accusations. He had a chance to defend himself. He had a chance to maybe get his way out. Jesus did not take it. Look at what it says as we continue on, starting in verse 6. Now it was a custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the, whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Now, he asked, do you want, uh, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? Pilate asked knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd and they have, um, to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. Now again, as we talk about the different Gospels and the different perspectives, one of the things that Matthew 27 also adds in is that while Pilate is making this judgment on Jesus, he gets word from his wife. He gets word from his wife in verse 19. It says, Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for, he, uh, for I have suffered a great deal uh, today in a dream because of him. You see, Pilate is pulled in all sorts of different directions. He knows in his heart that this man is not guilty, not guilty to be punished by death, by crucifixion. He's, he's getting this information from his wife that says, no, don't have anything to do with him. He's also being pulled away by the, the, the leaders of the law, the, the religious leaders. And then there's the crowd that comes to him because it was a, it was a common custom for them on Passover that, uh, that Pilate would, would release one prisoner. Let them go, let all their sins or all, their, uh, 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 all of their things that they've done wrong, be forgiven, and, and they are set free. And so in your mind, 
I'm sure Pilate was, was thinking. He was thinking that, well, here's my, here's my chance. Because he knew what the, uh, what the religious leaders were trying to do. They were obviously jealous of the power that Jesus had built, the following that he had had. Here was this new rabbi. Here was this new teacher that so many people were following and he, he had heard many things about. He knew what was going on in the religious world. And so he was thinking, oh, here's my, here's my chance. I'll let the people decide what happens to Jesus instead of me or the religious leaders. And so he gets to this tradition and says, well, who, who do you want me to let go? We can, we can let go of this man named Barabbas, who you all know is a murderer, or we can let this guy named Jesus go. You see, it was just a week before this that Jesus had rode into Jerusalem. You remember that? And there was a parade. Hosanna. The people were crying and out for him, and they were celebrating Jesus coming to town. I imagine that Pilate knew what was going on. And so he was thinking that surely this man who was just celebrated days before, the people are going to want to release him. But no. They stir up the crowd, and instead they cry to have Barabbas released. Multiple times, Pilate tries to set Jesus free, but finally, finally he couldn't find a way out. And even though that the religious leaders wanted to kill him, you know, he thought that they would let him go, but they, they did not. And, you know, this, is, this story is really just a, a perfect illustration of what goes on in our own lives in relationship to God. Because we are all guilty. But yet, just like Barabbas was set free and forgiven of the things that he had done, Jesus pays the price. Yet, just another illustration. On to verse 12, it says, Well, well what then should I do with the one that you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? Again, you hear this doubt in Pilate as he continues to ask, but they shouted even louder, Crucify him. Look at verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate releases Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Once again, this governor, even though he knew what he needed to do, could not be, could not be swayed, and the crowd overtook him, and he made the decision to hand Jesus over. Now, Mark accounts this. Look at these, these words, um, these four words in verse 15. It says, he had Jesus flogged. We read that and we kind of know what that means, but I don't really think we have a full understanding of that because as you go back and read Roman history on what a flogging was, in Mark it's just four little words, but it was so much more. Because the Romans had become experts at torturing and killing people. And that's what a flogging was. It, it was a beating with a, a whip, but it wasn't just a whip. It was a whip that had stones and, and sharp bones and sharp things in it so that, that when it struck Jesus back and it was pulled back, it would tear the flesh. It's recorded that many prisoners that received a flogging, they didn't survive. They never moved beyond that. There are many men that, that died in the process of, of flogging before they ever made it to the cross, but, but Jesus continues on. He hands them over to be crucified. Verse 16, look at what it says. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, and this is where all this takes place. Now, when it says there's a company of soldiers, I always had in my mind that it was, you know, just a few soldiers that are taking Jesus away. No, a company of soldiers, it's about 200 Roman soldiers. So this is a large group of, of hardened soldiers that are taking Jesus. Now, I already told you that there's a lot of animosity between the Romans and the Jews. And when they get Jesus alone... I imagine most of these soldiers have 
tortured many people. They've seen many crucifixions, and for them it was just it was part of the job, right? And so when they have this man who's, who's been convicted by Pilate, I think, well, we can do just about whatever we want to him because we know in just the next few hours he's going to be dead anyway. And so they begin to take some of their own aggression out toward what they know as, as the king of the Jews. Well, if you're the king, we really don't like your people. And so you know what? We're going to be pretty hard on you. And that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 17. It says, it says they put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him in the head with a staff and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, and they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to be crucified. So even after his beating, after he's been flogged, they continue to mock him. They put a robe on him. They put a crown of thorns, which continues to be painful. They spit on him. They beat him. They strike him. Again, he continues to go through this torture they led him away to be crucified verse 21 it says a certain man from Cyrene Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus was passing by on his way from the country and they forced him to carry his cross now this is one of those interesting sentences here in the gospel of Mark that goes into great detail because Simon of Cyrene he is a He's a tourist. He has come to Jerusalem more than likely for the Passover. He's come a long way. In fact, Cyrene is a, is a region, North Af Africa, it would have been today in Libya. And so he's come a long way to come back to Jerusalem. And you wonder as you read this passage, well, why so much detail about this guy that's just passing by? Yes, he carries Jesus' cross, but, but why, why name him? Why list his sons? It's as if Mark is writing to an audience who knows this man. In other words, early Christians who would be reading this account of the gospel, they would know who Simon of Cyrene and his sons Alexander and Rufus are. You see, this is part of the detail of what's going on here in the early church. But as we continue on, verse 22, it says, They brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him a wine mix with, with myrrh. This was kind of a, a, a drug that would dull, that dull the pain, but, but Jesus didn't take it. He wanted, to, he wanted to bear the full pain that was going on in the cross. Verse 24 says, And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. You see, it was Roman custom that when someone was crucified, that, that on their cross it would, it would say their name and what charge that was that they were crucified for. Well, what was Pilate going to say? I mean, he had to put king of the Jews. Well, he wasn't going to write on there, well, you know, the religious leaders in the crowd, they bullied me, so I gave in, and so we're going to crucify this man, even though he was innocent. King of the Jews is what they put on his cross. Verse 27 says, They crucified two rebels with him, one on, on his right and one on his left. Those who were passing by hurled insults, shaking their heads, saying, so you were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. They're twisting Jesus' words here of some of his earlier teaching. Verse 30, it says, Come down off the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross and so that we can see and believe and even those who were crucified with him also 
heaped insults on him. Again, putting ourselves in this place of what Jesus is, is going through, not because he desired to, not because he wanted to. He knew what he was going to face. He knew the torture. He knew the pain. He knew the loneliness that he would feel. But still yet, he went to the cross. And again, looking back at one of these prophecies, this time in Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, it says this, All who mock me, they hurl insults and shake their heads. He trusts the Lord, they said. Let the Lord rescue him. Isn't it interesting? The details of the prophecy that are played out right here in Mark 15. Looking on also at Psalm 22, verse 16, it says this. It says, dogs surround me. Uh, a pack of villains encircle me. Dogs was often uh, a term that, that Jewish folks use for Gentiles. This is, this is what we're talking about here. It says, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Yet, once again... Prophecy fulfilled here in Mark 15. Now, as we also um, look at this, it's important to look at verse 16. As David writes here, he says, They pierced my hands and my feet. Now understand this prophecy was written a thousand years before Jesus' time. David is writing this. And the piercing of hands and feet didn't happen to David. In fact, at this time, thousand years before when David is writing this, crucifixion is not invented. I mean, all scholars that have done all the research, historical research, they cannot find any culture that did a killing like a crucifixion. And so this idea of pierced hands and, and pierced feet, it's, it's kind of out of place. It's out of place for David's time and, and what's going on there. I mean, this is far before Rome has, has started to conquer other places. This is far before they have, they have come to perfect uh, these tortures of death. But yet, David prophesies about it a thousand years earlier. Never happened to David, but it did happen to Jesus. Continuing on, Mark 15, starting in verse thir uh, 33, it says, At noon, darkness came over the whole land, until three, uh, until 3 in the afternoon. Now, this is one of those passages that a lot of people wonder what this really means. We really have to put ourselves in this place because this is a significant event. Some people will say, well, is that just kind of a, a spiritual darkness that came over the land? No, 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 no. This is a physical darkness that came over the land right in the middle of the afternoon again one again once again one of these things that is prophesied darkness came over the land and i believe this was really a visual illustration of what was happening with god because as jesus is bearing all the weight of all the sins of the world god turns away and the world becomes dark verse 34 and then at three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing around heard this, they said, listen, he's calling to Elijah. Some ran and filled a sponge with, with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. You know, oftentimes when I think of Jesus' death on the cross, you think about all that he's gone through in the last day, the beatings, the torture, the crucifixion. And you think, boy, just at the end there, he just slips away, breathed his last breath. But it says, in a loud cry, do you know what it really happens in a crucifixion? It's not so much the nails and, and hanging on the cross. It's the asphyxiation that happens uh, while you're hanging on the cross that you can no longer breathe. And so for Jesus to cry out in a loud voice, you know what that means he had to do? It means he had to push up 
on the nails in his feet to fill his chest with lungs so he could cry out to God. I believe this was Jesus' final proclamation. It is finished. He's talking about what he came to do. The mission that he came to earth, the reason he came was for this very moment. And that was to put all of our sins, all of our mistakes on that cross and he became that sacrifice that pays for our sins. Look what happens here in verse 38. It says the, temp, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, that's a simple little line, but it's a significant, significant verse because it means something, especially means something to the Jewish people because for the Jews, they believed that, uh, that God was was um, present in the temple. That's, that's where God's presence was. And, and in the temple, it was divided to a place called the Holy of Holies. And if you understand Jewish law and Jewish tradition, there was only one person that could go into the presence of God, and they would just do that one time of year. They would go into the Holy of Holies, and they would make an atonement sacrifice for all the sins of the people. Once a year, they would do that. Well, when Jesus cried out his last breath and he died there on the cross, that, that temple curtain, which is 60 feet, 4 inches thick, is torn into two. In other words, it is, it's really displaying what's going on in our relationship with God. No longer it's saying that, that we need to be separated from God. No longer do we need to have a high priest make sacrifices for us because on the cross, the, the final sacrifice has been made, which I believe is, is really the backdrop for what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 5. He says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access to by faith, into the grace in which we now stand. You see, it's that access that Jesus did on the cross so that we could gain a relationship with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that's what's happening here on the cross. Jesus paid that ultimate price. The curtain was, told, was torn and the world shook. But look at this last little verse here in verse 39. Look at what it says. And when the centurion who stood, uh, stood there in front of Jesus, he saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the Son of God. Think about what that centurion has witnessed that day. More than likely, he was part of that company that took Jesus and they flogged him. And they beat him, and they mocked him. He was probably there as people passed by him, as they hurled insults while he hung on the cross. They, he saw how Jesus reacted, and he said, Surely this was the Son of God. Isaiah chapter 53 is kind of the final prophecy that we'll look at verses 11 and 12 it says this it says after he has suffered he will uh, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant will be will justify many and he will bear their iniquities our mistakes our sin verse 12 Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great, and he will divide up in the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made transgression for the trans, intercession for the trans 
transgressors. Again, as we think about this story of the sacrifice that, that Jesus made, it's one thing if we can answer that question, who is Jesus? It's another thing if you can answer that question, so what? So what? What are you going to do about that? If you know who Jesus is, how does that affect your life? How does that change how you act each and every day? Does it? Or is it just something that you do? Something that you claim? You see, part of believing in Jesus is allowing Him to change your life. I asked uh, those same folks that we saw earlier, I asked them, how has Jesus changed their life? I want you to see what they say. Watch again as we watch this video. Jesus has changed my life, first and foremost, by dying for my sins. Therefore, I get to know him. I get to be adopted into the family of God. I get to have my identity in Christ. And I can have an identity that doesn't shift, uh, that doesn't depend on me or my achievement or performance. Um, but I get to have peace knowing that I'll get to be with God forever and ever, and it'll get better and better. Jesus has changed my life by providing a goal and a standard for me to live by each and every day. Um, though I do not necessarily make that standard each and every day, I surely strive for it. Jesus to me is, he is my savior. He is my personal redeemer. Um, he impacts everything that I do. Um, because of Jesus, my life is not my own, but it's His. And as a result, um, it impacts how I, the type of wife that I am, the mother that I am. Um, I'm an ambassador to these kids on His behalf and um, a caregiver. And I try to do things that are according to His will, although I don't get it right and I'm not perfect. But the goal is to what is his will? What would Jesus want me to do? Um, am I bringing him glory? And even in my imperfections, I recognize that um, that's still for his good. When things don't go right, when there are trials, there's tribulations, um, all those things are for my sanctification, for growing me and developing me, stretching me to be more of who Jesus wants me to be. Jesus has changed my life in a lot of ways. He's made me more aware of my own fallen nature and it's given me a greater appreciation. It's made me a more thankful person to appreciate the sacrifice that Christ has made on my behalf to allow me to stand before a righteous God as an unrighteous person, but with the righteousness of Christ on me. And it's also, um, Christ has also benefited me as a guide and a friend, someone to turn to when you don't know what to do and what the questions are in life. And so he's, he's been very helpful to me in that regard as well. Jesus introduced me to the Father. I used to be lost and I was so far away from the Father and there wasn't any way that I could be close to Him. And so Jesus, because of His great love with which He loved me, He chose to die for me so that I could know the Father. And for that, I'm forever grateful because knowing Him is everything. This Sunday is... Adoption Sunday, celebrated across the world, and um, I think that's a perfect picture for this story today. You know, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, God chose each of us to be adopted into His family. You know what that means? That means we are children of God, and we get to celebrate, and we get to experience all the same love, grace that Jesus does with the Father. It's a great blessing. This morning, I hope you know who Jesus is, but more than that, I hope that you will allow Jesus to change your life. And maybe you've been coming to church for a time, or maybe you've been coming all your life, but you've never really given your heart to Him. This morning as we read these words of the great price that Jesus paid for each one of us, I pray that whatever misgivings you will have, 
Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. Sure, Jesus could, could forgive a lot of sins that other people have made, but not my mistakes. They're too big. I hope you realize that there is no mistake. There's nothing that you have done that can separate you from the love of God. Because Jesus paid that price on the cross for each and every one of us. If we would only receive that gift of God's love and His grace. This morning, if you'd like to take that next step, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I want to I encourage you to do so. If, if we can walk that journey with you, if we can help you do that, we, we want to be able to. So as we finish our time together, let's bow together in prayer. Our Father God, reading these words from Scripture sometimes are difficult. It's difficult for us to fully understand what, what you went through on the cross for us. And Father, it's also difficult for us at times to understand why. Why would you go through such great pain and sacrifice for me? After all the things I've done, I don't always understand. But I am so, so grateful for that gift. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Thank you for the grace that is given to us on the cross that covers all of our mistakes. Help us to realize that and live differently each and every day. Would you help us do that as we go from this place? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.